Today we're going to talk about electrochemistry, specifically their application of batteries. Batteries are one of the most commonly used forms of electrochemistry with the exception of the insulin pumps. So those with diabetes will actually have a little, sometimes will have a little pump on their side or they'll prick their finger or they'll use electrochemistry to figure out their blood glucose levels. So that's the most commonly form use of electrochemistry. That's an electrochemical sensor. But batteries are another use which are very interesting and so we're just going to talk about those in today's lecture. So, what is a battery? What it is, is it's harnessing the energy of flowing electrons. The thing to be noticed is that everything starts at the atomic level. So in the last lecture, we talked about how electrons flow and we can write our oxidation and reduction half reactions. All of that's happening at an atom. So even though you might have this big, huge nail like that's shown here of an iron nail, you're not oxidizing that whole thing all at once. What you're doing is individual electron transfers are happening between one individual copper atom and one individual iron atom. Okay, so those electrons are transitioning back and forth at the atomic level. And that's really what allows us to get this flow of electrons because there's so many of them and they're happening in such a good chain of reactions that they're flowing now through the wire up to your light bulb and they're able to generate that energy. So batteries are an excellent example of an oxidation reaction that occurs in a container. So these batteries can be either disposable or rechargeable. We'll talk about kind of the pros and cons of each. But basically they're set up so that materials will oxidize and reduce each other in such a way that they'll force electrons to flow in one direction. And so that's what's going on here is that you're consuming a chemical in order to generate electricity. So here's a good schematic of a battery. So here in the middle you have a graphite rod and if you notice electrons are flowing in that into this, this paste, this kind of light colored purple, that's your paste. And so that's your oxidizing agent, which what's, what's another name for oxidizing agent? The thing that's being reduced. And so it's being reduced and that's why your flow of electrons is flowing directly into that paste because it needs electrons to be reduced. Then there is a membrane, and that membrane is essentially working as a salt bridge. The whole purpose of a salt bridge, the whole purpose of a membrane, is to allow electrons to flow, but prevent or slow down the flow of ions. And so the idea here is that you've got stuff that can flow freely back and forth, but still you're going to have a setup so that your potential differences across that membrane can still exist. And so that membrane basically keeps your anode and your cathode separate. So then the zinc is your anode, so that's your reducing agent, and so that surrounds the whole battery. And then if you notice flowing out of the zinc is your electrons, because zinc is being oxidized, so it's producing electrons, it's releasing electrons, so now the electrons can flow out of the battery and toward your light bulb. Notice what direction they're flowing. They start out here at the anode, which is your negative charge in this battery. So then as it flows out, electrons are negatively charged, so they're naturally going to want to flow to the positive end of your battery. And so that's exactly what's happening whenever you've, you've got a battery that you're putting in, say, a toy or putting in a flashlight. You're, you're forcing the chemistry to happen such that your, your cathode is going to be accepting um, accepting electrons going to be reduced. This paste inside is going to be reduced. It's then going to send those, um, the electrons are then just going to flow towards your anode, your zinc cup. Your zinc is then going to release the electrons and, as it's oxidized and push them toward the wire. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you ever take a battery and you put it in the wrong way, can your battery, your flashlight still work? No, it doesn't work. And the reason for that is because if you're using chemicals to produce electricity, they can only produce a current flow in one direction. Because you're wanting to take your reduced species, it requires the electrons. Those electrons can't come out of thin air. So where does it come from? It comes from your anode. And so your anode's being oxidized and producing those electrons. So if you've got it flipped around the other way, it's not going to work because no longer now are you going to turn on your light bulb. Those electrons are just going to cross directly across that membrane. The current's going to flow the other direction. So then what purpose do you have? Or how would you, why, why would you want to like light up that membrane basically is what I'm trying to say. And so basically you're not allowing them to work because the resistance is not the same. Okay, there's a little bit more chemistry involved in there. But that's kind of the basic idea is that in order for just a typical alkaline battery to work, those electrons have to flow from your anode to your cathode and then they can power the device that's in line in the middle of it.
Your cathode is the electrode where chemicals are reduced. An electrode is just a fancy way of saying where the chemistry is happening. So the cathode is where chemicals are reduced, while the anode is where electrodes or chemicals are being oxidized. So I always remembered anode oxidation, and that's just something I always associate together. Anode ox, anode ox. So your cathode then, remember, that's where your current flows into the battery, whereas your anode is where current flows out of the battery into the object. And because of that, it carries a negative charge because then whenever your anode, which is oxidizing, is producing these electrons, they're negative. So then the negative charge wants to flow toward the positive end, which is your cathode. Now, rechargeable batteries are a little bit different. They can switch their current in order to regenerate the chemistry. So the idea here is if you don't have a rechargeable battery, you won't be able to regenerate the chemistry. It just doesn't work like that. But if you have a rechargeable battery, the chemistry is made such that not only can you flow energy in one direction, electrons in one direction, you can also reverse the flow in the opposite direction. So now instead of using chemistry to create a flow of electrons, you say you take your iPod out and you or your iPad or whatever you got your 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 cell phone, plug it into the wall. You're now regenerating that chemistry because you're forcing electrons from the wall into your phone, and you're recharging your battery that way. So you're regenerating the chemistry. So that way, when you're ready to discharge your battery once again, because you unplug it and you start playing a game or something, now you're reusing your battery and the current's flowing the opposite way. So the way the terminals work is the terminal that was the cathode is now the anode and vice versa. But regardless, oxidation always occurs at the anode. Reduction always occurs at the cathode. But that's what makes rechargeable batteries unique, is that they can switch their flow in order to recharge the battery. All right, so let's look at the chemistry of a dry cell battery. So this is the same example we just showed you previously. And so in this example, zinc is oxidized. Now the chemistry at the cathode is a little more complex. So what you have here is you have ammonia, which is an H4+, is going to react to produce ammonia. Then that ammonia can then go on further and react with zinc chloride, and the hydrogen goes on to react with manganese oxide. And so then those can both be another subsequent reaction to produce different chemicals other than the starting products. So basically, you have your reduction happening in one step, but then you further have subsequent reactions that don't really do anything, but it's because you produce these additional reactions, that's what's preventing it really from being reduced and be able to recharge your battery. Whereas your rechargeable batteries then, they're gonna be more unique and they're gonna be able to go back and forth both directions, and we'll look at those in a second. The alkaline battery is, is typical, it's similar to the dry cell battery, okay, but it utilizes a very basic paste. So that's what alkaline paste is referring to. So it's a very basic paste. So it's the same idea that you can't go back, you can't recharge these batteries, um, but these are a little bit more different than that dry cell battery that we just referred to um, because they've got a very consistent voltage. So it's kind of the reaction that's happening here is a very stable reaction. So kind of what you need to know about the alkaline and the dry cell battery is they're kind of based on the same premise of an anode to a cathode, and you've got your electrons flowing, and you can't reverse them because you're going to destroy the chemistry whenever you try and do so. Other types of disposal batteries are mercury batteries and lithium batteries. As you can guess, mercury batteries are no longer really used anymore because of environmental hazards. Lithium batteries, typically instead of using zinc then as your outer part of the battery, you can use lithium. And what that does is it's a higher voltage, it makes lighter batteries, and so some of your fancier batteries are this way, but they're not still the rechargeable. Typically what is going to happen and has been happening lately is that lithium has been used for these rechargeable batteries because it seems to be a better, more, a better use of lithium. Whereas zinc, it's cheap, it's wonderful, it's still stable, and it's good enough for most applications. Um, you can still make them out of lithium, but mostly lithium is going to be used for your rechargeable batteries. So then, rechargeable batteries. Um, they, they then, their oxidation reduction reactions that are happening can now be reversible. So instead of like the dry cell battery where you create this additional chemistry that's happening and therefore you can't reverse it, it's instead going to be a very reversible reaction. A reaction that can instead of just producing current in one direction, you can switch the current and cause the chemistry to happen in reverse. And so one example of this is nickel metal hydride, and that's what the big M stands for, um, is it can be any metal. And so that's where you can stick like nickel 
lithium hydride you can stick a bunch of metals in there so um, and you can have multiple metal types within a single battery and so a lot of that's trade specific and so some of the recipes aren't you know perfectly published they're all patented and that kind of thing but the idea here is is you're going to use nickel metal and water that's going to react and it's going to produce nickel hydride and a hydroxide ion and so this reaction is very stable and it can go back and forth back and forth and so traditional car batteries are a different type, but most of your other rechargeable batteries, the ones that you've gotten like um, cell phones, um, I'm drawing like camera batteries, that kind of thing, those are gonna be rechargeable batteries. Kind of the fun thing about the differences between rechargeable batteries and alkaline batteries is power output and, and stability. If you ever notice, rechargeable batteries are not shipped straight to your home completely charged. Why not? Because from the time they make that battery to the time that they sell it and you get it put into whatever device you have, chances are that battery is going to discharge because it's not very stable over time. As opposed to alkaline batteries, they ship it to you charged because those things are stable for like five years, very long time and so they can ship it to you charged whereas rechargeable batteries they have more power so whereas alkaline batteries are great long term storage that's why they're perfect for flashlights I never keep any of my rechargeable batteries in my flashlights why because I don't use my flashlights every day and so by the time I go to turn on my flashlight if I had a rechargeable battery in it the battery might be dead because typically rechargeable batteries only have a shelf life of like 30 days but they have excellent power output. So if you put an alkaline battery inside of your camera, for instance, that battery might be dead in like 10 minutes. Whereas a rechargeable battery might last half an hour, an hour, even more. And so the reason for it is it's got a greater power output, but it's not as stable. But if you only need it for a couple hours, it's perfect. Um, and so this is one thing that's really being um, improved upon in the market because everybody wants a better battery. The better you can have it, the more stable, the more power you can get out of it, the easier it's going to sell, the, the longer we're going to be able to consume our devices for longer periods of time. All right, so let's talk about the kind that can be now inside of cars. So lithium iron batteries are actually used within hybrid cars. Um, also, laptops and cell phones, they can be, like I said before, the nickel metal hydride, they can also be these lithium ion batteries. Um, and so lithium really is taking off in batteries just because of a lot of its properties, which we're not really going to get into a lot in this course. Um, but just kind of the point is, is kind of thinking about the importance of how electrochemistry fits into our world today. So then fuel cell, there are two more types of, of energy that I really kind of want to discuss. The next one being a fuel cell. A fuel cell is a device that converts energy of fuel into electrical energy. So whereas before with our batteries, we're really talking about like a chemistry of like a dry cell or a, you know, a metal hydride type device. But this one we're referring to like a hydrogen oxygen type fuel or just some form of fuel that can be consumed in order to produce electricity. Photovoltaic cells now are kind of similar, but it's opposite. Instead of now having like a fuel that you're using, like, you know, gasoline or something, you're going to convert sunlight into energy. And so they must have a direct means of converting that sunlight to that electrical energy. So these would be like your solar panels that you've got. Um, that's kind of the most common use. They can be installed in homes, many other locations, but the main thing to know is fuel cells, you take fuel, turn it into energy. Photovoltaic, you take the sunlight and you turn it into energy. How they do that is pretty neat. So here you see a solar power powered calculator and you see some homes that are powered with solar panels. And the cost of these is going down significantly. So a lot of homes now can make way more energy than they can consume. And so I've known some people who they actually get paid every single month because they stuck these on their house. So the cost of renting or leasing or whatever the solar panels is less than the cost that they're getting paid every single month. So cost is going down. So how do they work? So how they work is they, they can be made of silicon that's been doped. Doping just simply means, yeah, not like the, the Lance Armstrong kind of doping. This is a different kind of doping. Um, doping just simply means you're sticking in an element within a bigger complex matrix of one type of element. So in this situation on the left, you've got silicon that's been doped with um, arsenic. And so arsenic is the dissimilar metal that you're sticking into amongst all the other atoms of silicon. 
Or you can have like boron doping, where boron's been stuck into this complex matrix. So what's going on here is that if you notice on the left hand side, silicon has four electrons in its outer shell, whereas arsenic has five. And so it's got an extra electron, if you will, because it looks like they're all supposed to have four. But now you've got this extra electron floating around, and so it's, it's, it's considered like an extra electron. An idea is it doesn't match everything else. Whereas on the right, boron only has three, so it's missing an electron. So N is called N-type because it contains extra electrons, and electrons are negatively charged. So the N stands for negative. The P-type is called P-type because it's missing an electron. So you're missing an electron, so therefore it's going to be more positive compared to its surroundings, so it's P-type standing for positive. So then what happens is you can junction these two together, and there are multiple different like uh, prototypes for how you can join together these, these junctions because in, in order to enable electrons to flow. The idea here is, is that if you have extra electrons in the n-type, they can flow toward the p-type and then you can kind of generate a current that's produced simply by joining these two different types and that current can then enter into a wire and form a complete circuit. And so that's kind of the basic minimum of how these photovoltaic devices work, but the idea is that whenever light hits these devices, they cause those free electrons to jump, um, and that, that movement of electrons then is what causes this flow of electrons. So kind of to recap this, batteries allow chemistry to do work through redox reactions. Oxidation place takes, takes place at the anode, while reduction takes place at the cathode. Rechargeable batteries require electrons to flow the opposite direction in order to rejuvenate the chemistry. Fuel cells convert fuel to electrical energy, and photovoltaic cells convert light into electrical energy.